Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Zatanna, 2, 5. Hello team, welcome to the Watchtower, and welcome also to our 8th installment of Secret Origins. In this series we'll be diving into the history of the main characters in Young Justice, the heroes, the supporting cast, and even the villains. Today we celebrate the penultimate member of the first season's team, and fan favorite, Zatanna Zatara. Before we get started, I wanted to apologize ahead of time. I've been putting off recording for several weeks, waiting for this cold to subside, but apparently, like many of my friends in the U.S., this season's colds are weeks-long endeavors, and I've come to accept that this is my life now. So please excuse the sound of my voice. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. We're not really taking a tour, are we? No. We're hunting down that robot. Yes, we are. Oh, wow. Out loud and everything. What about New Girl? I'm sure she won't tell. I can't tell. Not if you kidnap me. Oh, she's going to fit in great. So Zatanna Zatara's first appearance was back in 1964, November of 1964, with Hawkman number four. And she was created by Gardner Fox and Murphy Anderson. The first appearance of her father, though, Zatara, is from Action Comics number one back in June 1938, which is the same issue that featured the world's first superhero, Superman. And he was created by Fred Gardner. So Zatanna's pre-Crisis on Infinite Earth's origin story. She's the daughter of Giovanni, a.k.a. John, Zatara, and a woman named Sindela, who is a member of the mystical race Homo Magi. Zatanna is a skilled stage magician who has access to magical powers via her bloodline. Zatanna's first appearance in Hawkman was as part of an arc where she was investigating the disappearance of her father, which was an arc that wove through various titles for three years, from 1964 to 1967. Zatanna appeared in a number of comics, including backup features in Adventure Comics and Supergirl, as well as in Justice League of America, until she was officially inducted as a member of the JLA in 1978. Her stories often happened as part of team-ups with other DC heroes like Superman in DC Comics Presents, Batman in Brave and the Bold, and Wonder Woman in World's Finest. Uh, she did not have her own series, and she hasn't had her own series uh, until much, much later. After Crisis on Infinite Earths in the 80s, a lot of characters' origins were retconned or reinvented. Zatanna's was pretty much the same as far as I can tell. Her most memorable appearance, at least for me anyway, was Neil Gaiman's incredible Books of Magic, where she befriends and protects Timothy Hunter, a boy destined to become the world's greatest sorcerer. In 2004, DC attempted another reboot, which took Zatanna kind of a darker and controversial direction. Identity Crisis in 2004 was a bit of a an industry-wide, or DC Comics industry anyway, wide series that started a little rough and got rougher. In Identity Crisis, we discover that Zatanna has used her magic on numerous occasions to mind-wipe villains, particularly when they've uncovered the hero's secret identities. Unfortunately, in this opening scene of Identity Crisis, she even mind wipes Batman. As far as I know, that she's the only he's the only hero that she's used this power on, and she was reluctant to use it, I should say. But the other heroes at the time encouraged her to make this choice and do it. That event caused kind of side effects that DC writers have used to retcon various changes to their villains. Uh, for example, in this case, at the beginning of Identity Crisis, her memory wipe was used on a character named Dr. Light. Dr. Light, at one point in DC history, was kind of an intellectual powerhouse and, that's for some reason, turned into a kind of a silly throwaway villain. And this rewriting of his memory was a good way to, well, it was a way to uh, explain why that happened. They also tried to use it to explain why Selina Kyle the, 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 had a motivation to transform from a villain to a hero, pretty much completely negating her own agency of these decisions, which I think is terrible. Identity Crisis had several challenges, including being the story arc that was the origin of the term fridging, uh, as it was Kyle Rayner's girlfriend who had been killed and 
stuffed in a refrigerator early in the run. Uh, the term fridging is typically used the idea of killing a character, particularly a female character, simply to motivate a male character to do whatever they need to do. It is a really frustrating, unfortunately, and dismissive way of utilizing female characters in a story. Post-Crisis Satana's early years had been retconned a little bit. I think in part thanks to Batman the Animated Series. And that retcon included the fact or the idea that Bruce Wayne had been trained in escapology by Zatanna's father. And therefore the two had known each other for years and had become friends. And in Batman the Animated Series, this is when the first time I remember this idea being introduced. Bruce had hidden his identity in the animated series behind the name John Smith. And during the series, his identity was revealed to Zatanna and they had been friends and, uh, I don't think they had a relationship, but at least some flirting in the animated series. Zatanna had her own miniseries starting in uh, 2005 that had her losing her powers due to the guilt behind the aforementioned mind wipes, uh, as well as uh, because of a failed ritual that led to the releasing of a demon. Aside from that, her appearances continued to be mostly as guests in other series such as Justice League at least until her own brief series in 2010 that was written by Paul Dini and drawn by uh, Stefan Rue. Uh, but that series only ran about 16 issues and then ran into the reboot, uh, the New 52 reboot in 2011. As part of the New 52 re- reboot, Zatanna is first presented as a member of Justice League Dark. She also appeared alongside Black Canary in a graphic novel called Bloodspell, where we learned that the teenage Canary and the teenage Zatanna had met before their adult superhero adventures. And I've heard some good things about the series and some, uh, some concerns about that series as well. So you can go check that out yourself and, and have your own opinions. As far as Zatanna's powers are concerned, in DC Comics, her powers have always been a bit loosely defined. So magic in DC Comics is often pretty much loose across the board anyway. In the 70s, her wide-ranging, powered-by-plot magic was trimmed down to be a control over the four classic Western elements, which is air, earth, fire, and water, but has since been expanded back out to cover basically whatever spell is needed to have the plot move forward. Powerful sorcerers such as John Constantine and Jason Blood, who is the alter ego of the demon Etrigan, have asked for her help on numerous occasions because they see her as more powerful and more specialized in whatever task at hand happens to be going on in the comic at the time. So she has a reputation as being a powerful spellcaster across the board. Though the expression of her magic, or at least the focus of her magic, is in the reciting of spells in backwards English, modern stories lean toward that being basically just her go-to for spellcasting and not her limit. Uh, As we see in Young Justice, she's also skilled in a range of rituals and is able in the show with the help of the goddess Isis to recreate the ritual that took the blue scarab offline thousands of years before. In numerous early stories, preventing her from speaking was an easy way to take away her power But in several modern stories, she's gotten around that by casting spells through written means. In one story, she was actually shot in the throat, but managed to heal the damage by casting a spell using her own blood, like written on a piece of paper. And and typically, it's still words written backwards and that kind of thing. But I would like to see her expand her power set out. In Young Justice, they changed a lot about Zatanna. And I think, honestly, it's for the better. I do enjoy the idea that Bruce trained with Zatara and that Zatanna and Bruce were friends. But that connection plays very loosely in the regular DC series to the point of almost not actually existing as canon. And the identity crisis-related arcs and the consequences of that, they just bother me to this day. Zatanna is a character that has always had a following, and it's been my impression because this is the way it is for me, that the following is as much for what Zatanna can be as to, as opposed to how she's often portrayed. What Young Justice manages to do 
is reinvent this fan favorite hero into many fans' emotional memory of who and what Zatanna can be. It creates a believable and loving relationship with her father, somewhat recreates the missing father origin storyline in a way that pulls us closer to Zatanna as a character and makes her plight with her recovering her father seem real. Her powers are explained and limited in a way that works for the story and isn't as driven by plot as many magical DC characters in the comics. And though it continues with the sometimes questionable Zatanna must be in a romantic relationship with someone in this story trope, the uh, connection between Zatanna and Dick Grayson in season one, it just, it, unlike a lot of the other relationships, it immediately feels genuine and not forced, born out of their personalities and who they are as characters and people and not something as her, she's the only girl in the story, so she's got to have a relationship with one of the guys. In fact, most of her relationships in the comics are with other magicians because, I don't know, magic? Robin being a non-magical hero, to me, even helps make the relationship feel more genuine and grounded in some way based on who they are as people. So, like Emily, I would have enjoyed more Zatanna in Season 2 and hopefully in the upcoming Season 3. But I have to admit that I'm pretty satisfied with her limited arc. I love that the showrunners allowed Zatanna to have more powers than just speaking backwards, particularly in Season 2. Giving her a knowledge and understanding of the fundamentals of magic and the ability to perform powerful rituals As well as, if I'm remembering correctly, in the episode where Despero arrives and they're trapped in the Hall of Justice, when she wakes up from having been stunned by Despero, she casts a spell, but I don't remember her speaking backwards. So I think as time moves on for her, she may become more powerful than her father would have become had he not become Dr. Fate. I think Zatara in the series is a powerful spellcaster, but the Homo Magi race is actually, well, I wouldn't say prominent in the DC Comics universe, but Zatara's father, I mean, excuse me, Zatanna's uh, mother is not the only one in history, uh, the DC Comics history. It's possible we'll see much more of Zatanna in season three. When I start thinking about what role she could play, it occurred to me that Tracy 13, who is another Homo Magi character in the series, she's been announced as a member of the Outsiders cast. With few exceptions, the new characters in season two were all shown with some connection uh, or mentorship to the previous season's heroes. I would love to see Zatanna acting as a mentor to Tracy and a counterpoint to the relationship that Tracy has with her father. Dr. 13, her father, is a skeptic of such incredible magnitude that in the standard DC canon, magic doesn't work on him. So though he had a relationship with a woman who was also a homo magi and is Tracy's mother, it's a very complicated thing. I'm curious to see how they end up incorporating that into season three of Young Justice. So I guess we'll see. As far as recommendations are concerned, unfortunately, even with the 50 plus year history of Zatanna in the comics and the fact that Zatara is literally along with Superman, one of, if not the oldest superhero in DC history, in comic history, There just aren't that many cornerstone stories that I can recommend as I can for the rest of the team. There is a story arc, the Justice League of America 161 through 166. Those issues recount the story of Zatanna's search for her mother and are considered quite good by many of the Zatanna fan sources. The arc technically ends at issue 165, but apparently has some follow-up in issue 166 that some of the reprints don't you know, take into account. So if you buy them and buy the individual issues, somehow you make sure to include the 166. 
Comixology has issue 161 available. We'll have a link in the show notes for that. But I couldn't find the rest of the series except in their original form uh, available through Amazon or more than likely through your friendly local comic store, which I highly recommend you go frequent. If you happen to be in San Diego, I highly recommend Southern California Comics as a go-to for current and past, past comics. If you're in and around Orange County, also in Southern California here, I recommend you check out Comic Quest in Lake Forest, which is a comic store I used to work for back in the day. If you're up in the Santa Cruz area in California, I cannot recommend Atlantis Fantasy World highly enough. Joe and Dottie, the owners there, are incredible people and very supportive and active in the community. The other uh, series I'd recommend isn't really a series for her, but it is the Books of Magic miniseries. Books of Magic was written, as I mentioned before, by Neil Gaiman with art by John Bolton, Scott Hampton, Paul Johnson, and Charles Vess, who is absolutely one of my favorites. You can also find Zatanna appearances in a number of animated series or movies, including, of course, as I mentioned before, Batman the Animated Series. She makes an appearance in Justice League Unlimited. Batman Brave and the Bold, she has an appearance. There's a web series called Gotham Girls that you can look up. She makes an appearance there. Justice League Action, she showed up. And as a co-starring role in the DC animated universe movie Justice League Dark, But uh, keep in mind that Justice League Dark is one of the few uh, DC animated films that is uh, rated R. It's fantastic. I I really enjoyed it. Don't watch it with your littles if they happen to be around. And that wraps up Episode 8 of Secret Origins. Next time, we'll finish off our look at the Season 1 team with a dive into Raquel Irvin, a.k.a. Rocket. You can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at theyjfiles.tumblr.com and at our website, www.crashingthemode.com. Of course, you can also email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating or a review, please let us know, especially if you're outside of the U.S. We have, a, have to look a little harder to find those. And even though season three is almost here, hopefully 2018, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. Buy YJ Comics on Comixology to get uh, more stories even sooner than the animated series and get yourself up to speed for the season three premiere. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.